Well, folks, we are living in a time of depolarization among our political parties. Reaching across the aisle can often cost lawmakers their job, so you rarely see it, except when it comes to certain issues, issues like war. Now, one month ago today, Congress passed H.R. 568, a resolution that seems to be designed to prepare for war with Iran. The U.S. House of Representatives passed it 401 to 11. U.S. Senators of both parties have also gotten together and have written a letter to the President. There are meetings today in Moscow with the IAEA regarding Iran's nuclear policy. And in this letter, those Senators urge President Obama, they say, if those meetings in Moscow produce no substantive agreement, to reevaluate the utility of further talks and instead focus on significantly increasing pressure on the Iranian government through sanctions and making clear that a credible military option exists. They remind the president of his own words that the window of diplomacy is closing. So what does this all mean? Are the drums of war really beating as loud as they seem to be? And what's the timeline here? To talk more about this, I've got Jamal Abdi, policy director for the National Iranian American Council. Uh, so let's talk about this. What do you make of this letter? Uh, this letter uh, came out when it did for very clear reasons, and that's because the United States and Iran are in the process of negotiation right now. Uh, today, Iran, the U.S., and the other members of the Permanent Five uh, Security Council, U.N. Security Council, uh, came together for the third round of negotiations aimed at achieving some short-term measures that can address our most profound concerns about the Iranian nuclear program. Um, the goal is to get some near-term steps that can assure us that Iran, uh, their window to potentially building a nuclear weapon is extended. Uh, this letter was come out, uh, was, was presented really to undermine those talks and to set the bar so high for success uh, that we would fail, the diplomatic process would be over, and we would pretty much be gearing up to, uh, to take military action against Iran. Yeah, I mean, there's talk that, that some people want to make clear that Congress really sort of has the reins here, that, uh, you know, President Obama doesn't necessarily uh, have the power to, to make the decisions because he sort of uh, seems to be like, hey, you know, let's do diplomacy uh, above all else. Um, I guess talk a little bit about um, these short-term fixes. That's what you that's what you call them. Uh, this is one thing that a lot of people say we don't need any more short-term fixes. We need long-term solutions. Well, the problem is that we haven't talked to Iran for 30 years. Uh, there is tremendous mistrust on both sides, and so in order to build towards a process where we actually can resolve all of our concerns about Iran's nuclear program as well as concerns about human rights, uh, Iran's regional role. In order to get there, we actually have to have some talks and build confidence, take uh, you know, short-term steps. The, the step that uh, experts are saying is possible right now is to get Iran to freeze its enrichment at 20 percent and agree to, uh, to, to basically be enriching at a lower level that takes it further away from the level needed to, uh, to potentially build a nuclear weapon. Now, in order to get that, which would be a pretty significant nonproliferation win to actually get Iran to scale down its enrichment, in order to get that, we would actually have to use some of the leverage that we've stocked up, which is the sanctions that Congress has so diligently passed over the past couple years. Um, and unfortunately, a big part of what Congress has done is to really assert that we're in control of the sanctions. Uh, don't you dare lift the sanctions in exchange for Iranian concessions. And we must demand the most maximal goals possible uh, that are not achievable. Uh, and if that doesn't work out, immediately exit the diplomatic trajectory and start ramping up some of the planning for war. I mean, it seems to an extent, Jamal, that, that that's really what the goal is for a lot of these, you know, lawmakers, is, is they uh, want war no matter what. Yeah, and it's really, it's about constraining the president's options, and I'm very concerned that these talks that are happening in Moscow are not going to go forward, not necessarily because of uh, Iranian unwillingness to negotiate on some of those interim steps, but really, uh, uh, you know, the U.S., uh, the negotiating team not having the space from Congress to be able to leverage those sanctions and potentially um, preventing the Europeans from lifting their own sanctions, uh, some of their sanctions, the, very, the ones that are coming up very soon on Iranian oil exports. Um, so basically by Congress presenting letters like this, uh, by warning against lifting sanctions uh, at all, uh, for the, you know, unlike previous times where you hear the Iranians are playing for time, the Iranians aren't willing to make a deal, you actually have the Iranians 
very concerned that sanctions are about to hit at the end of the month. These very uh, and those sanctions can be absolutely crippling on uh, the majority of the people there. Don't necessarily affect those at you know at the highest level of power, but they are uh, you know just brutal and really detrimental to the lives of people there. Yeah, these are the same types of sanctions we saw against Saddam Hussein, which, as we all know, didn't result in first of all Saddam or his regime suffering. Uh, his people did all of the starving and the dying when those sanctions were in place, uh, and eventually didn't topple that regime, but uh, required military action in order to get rid of the, the regime in place. And 10 years later, the U.S. has only now been able to, to remove itself from that war. Uh, with Iran, we're talking about something on a far greater scale, and it is looking more and more like these sanctions are in place not to use as leverage in negotiations, but to use as a tool for regime change down the line. Uh, and we should say, it's not just the lawmakers pushing President Obama to really keep a military option on the table. Uh, there's also a group called the Emergency Committee for Israel. They've put out a commercial, and I want to play just a little part of it, and then we'll talk about it. Iran's development of a nuclear weapon, I believe, is unacceptable. We do want to make sure that by the end of this year, we've actually seen a serious process move forward. President Obama has spent four years talking. Iran has spent four years building a secret nuclear site, nuclear fuel near weapons level, long-range missiles. Obama is still talking, and Iran has enough fuel for five nuclear bombs. Talking isn't working. It's time to act before it's too late. I don't know about you, but I'm scared now. After seeing that commercial, it's really <laughs> frightening. I mean, uh, is that the point, not really to urge Obama, but, but to really get, you know, Americans sort of uh, place the fear of God uh, about evil Iran in them? Well, this is the same organization. This is Foreign Policy Initiative. Uh, it's headed by Bill Kristol. These are the exact same people who were behind the Iraq War. Uh, they were, it was the project for a new American century. They effectively drafted up the designs for uh, invading Iraq and then helped sell that by... Uh, scaring the American public into thinking that there was an imminent threat that required military action. And you're not the first person I've heard say that, that, that says this is looking a lot like the initial lead up to the Iraq War. Yeah, there are a lot of similarities here. They have the same playbook. It worked in 2003. Uh, there's a potential... But haven't American people gotten smarter? Um, and, and American lawmakers? You know, I think the, the, the problem here is that we need to look at this in the long term. Uh, you know, the commercial says for the past four years we've been talking to Iran. The reality is, for the past four years, we've been sanctioning Iran, ratcheting up those sanctions. We've only now started to have that diplomatic process. Uh, but while we were doing the sanctions, a lot of people said, look, this is a trajectory to war. This is exactly what we had with Saddam, not necessarily right before we went to war with Iraq, but in the 90s when we were ratcheting up the sanctions and uh, creating a policy of regime change. Uh, so what happened in Iraq wasn't something that happened overnight. It was a long process. With Iran, you know, the, the sanctions have very much queued up uh, this, this sense of inevitability, that if the sanctions don't work now, we're going to have to pull the trigger and go to war. Um, I think that if this diplomatic process breaks down that's now in place, uh, we're going to see calls like the one from ECI uh, uh, rapidly escalate in Congress, uh, in the media. Uh, at, at some of these right-wing think tanks. I think that that's really dangerous. Talk a little bit about these meetings that are going on right now in Moscow with the IAEA. Um, you say that, that they have the possibility, the potential to really sort of get a few things done, um, but that there's other forces standing in the way. What do you think they could possibly get done? I think in the near term that there could be a deal to end Iran, or freeze Iran's enrichment at 20 percent in exchange for uh, concessions from the U.S. or the EU on these sanctions that are coming down the line. Uh, the issue is that a lot of these folks who are running these ads or signing these letters don't actually want to see a diplomatic process that is successful and are concerned that if there's a, a short-term deal uh, that that could queue up a longer-term diplomatic process that would put bombing uh, that whole military option could put that off for, uh, you know, uh, the foreseeable future. So if traction isn't allowed to be created at the talks, uh, we can immediately go to that, that military option. So the groups that are advocating right now are really doing it to try to sabotage these talks. And the letter in Congress, for instance, was supported by, you know, uh, groups like AIPAC, as well as groups like the Mujahideen Khalq, which is a... Uh, you know, it's an Iranian exile group that is actually designated as a terrorist organization. This is the MEK. The MEK. They are now, you know, lobbying in the U.S. in spite of the fact that they're considered a terrorist organization and working with lawmakers to craft these, uh, these letters designed to undermine the talks and uh, uh, clear the course for war. 
Jamal, you always hear, though, um, you know, sort of the other side of this. You always hear, uh, you know, what, what happens if these sanctions go in place and those at the top in Iran, uh, you know, they decide to, to use those nuclear capabilities? Or, or what if, uh, you know, Iran, you know, the, every day there's, we're getting closer to a, a graver threat from Iran towards U.S., towards Israel. Um, what is your response to people who say that? Because there are a lot of people who really sort of believe this, uh, you know, villain you know, character that we've given to Iran. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the fear-mongering is designed, I think, to short-circuit some of the rational uh, thinking that needs to be involved in addressing what is a, a, a real problem. Uh, there is a need for greater transparency in Iran's nuclear program. Uh, the, but the, the solution to the problem of what are Iran's aspirations in terms of its nuclear program uh, doesn't involve military action. Uh, if you go down the line, military leaders have said, if we bomb Iran, uh, we're not going to be able to take out their program. We can only delay it for as, as long as three years. In that time, Iran would reconstitute its program and likely make the decision, which they haven't yet made, to actually actively pursue a nuclear weapon. As it stands, you know, Leon Panetta was on uh, 60 Minutes a couple weeks ago, and he made clear Iran is nowhere uh, near an imminent nuclear weapon. He's not the only one that said that. A lot of top U.S. officials have said this that. This is the consensus across the board. Uh, what groups like ECI are doing is to try to make this seem like an even more imminent threat uh, and then not actually evaluating what are the consequences of military action uh, and leaving out the, what the real solution is, which is a diplomatic breakthrough that can only be achieved through robust long-term diplomacy. And certainly, as we know, when the message is manipulated, sometimes you get enough people without the, all that knowledge behind them uh, calling for things uh, that could be really detrimental to a whole lot of countries. Uh, appreciate your insight. You certainly have a lot of uh, good stuff here. Jamal Abdi, Policy Director for the National Iranian American Council.